Welcome to today's sustainability lecture series. My name is Jasmine Farabash and I work as a project planner SDG engagement with the Sustainability Council. Uh, before we get into the lecture today, uh, we're going to start things off with uh, a land acknowledgement. Uh, so the University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we're located on Treaty 6 territory and Métis Nation Zone 4, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Sioux, uh, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, and Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. For today's talk, um, we will be having uh, Sean Stepchuk with Waste for Edmonton providing the talk, Municipal Grassroots Environmental Activism with Waste for Edmonton. Um, so the structure of the talk, if you haven't been to one of these events, is that we'll be hearing a presentation from Sean for about uh, half an hour, and then there will be a chance for some questions and answers at the end. I uh, can feel free to pop your questions and answers into the chat, uh, and we'll collect those and um, kind of post them, post them to Sean. Uh, also, if you're less familiar, this talk is part of the Sustainability Council, Council Lecture Series. Uh, so during the academic year, the Sustainability Council hosts interdisciplinary scholars, professionals, and activists who engage with sustainability, climate change, and the environment. Uh, and the lecture series, we aim to host them bi-weekly throughout the academic year. Um, a note uh, for the benefit of those who couldn't make it with us today, um, we're recording the lecture and we'll publish it online on our YouTube channel in a few weeks. Uh, the audience won't appear in the video if you're, if you're wondering. Uh, so now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Sean Stepchuk is a co-founder and director of Waste Free Edmonton. He's passionate about tackling unnecessary sources of waste and helping build the waste reduction community in Edmonton. Uh, outside of work, Sean enjoys traveling with his family and learning about different cultures. He spends a lot of time involved with outdoor activities, including hiking, running, kayaking, biking, skiing, gardening, and scuba diving. Very cool. Uh, Sean also likes to relax, spending evenings at home with his wife, son, and cat, Ploppers. Uh, so I will uh, stop sharing now and pass, uh, pass things over to you. All right. Well, thank you uh, very much for, for having me and for the introduction. Um, as Jasmine said, my name is Sean Stepchuk and I'm a director and co-founder of Waste Free Edmonton. Uh, I was asked to come speak here today uh, about our uh, municipal activism and particularly with respect to our efforts to get a single use bylaw. Uh, now, let me first say that this is a case study about what we actually did. Uh, there are many textbooks and other books out there about uh, activism and theories of change and building organizations. And those are things that are, are certainly great to read. And there's probably a lot of information in those that I'm not giving you today. This is just what, what we did, how we grew and uh, ended up getting the success with a, a single use bylaw that we did. Uh, also say I'm just at the tail end of having uh, COVID. And so if I cough a little bit, uh, please uh, bear with me, but I'm, I think I'm 99% uh, of the way uh, back. So Waste Free Edmonton, we are a grassroots organization that is working to significantly reduce the amount of waste produced in Edmonton. And our initial focus was on single use plastics. Uh, that was our initial focus. We've expanded a lot beyond that, uh, but that's where we started. And that's what this is primarily going to be about today. Uh, we're 100% volunteer uh, driven and we were founded back in, in 2018. So I guess I'll start with, with now, where are we now? So. Uh, as of uh, about two weeks ago, um, we now have on the books in Edmonton a single use bylaw. Um, this was passed by city council after a public hearing. And what this does very briefly is it bans plastic bags at retail and grocery and plastic alternatives, which I'll talk about later. Uh, there's a fee on paper and reusable bags. Uh, Restaurants have to provide to stay options. So that means if you go to a, a Starbucks or a McDonald's, uh, once this is in effect, then they'll have to provide you with a, a reusable cup, um, which is fantastic. If you're a coffee drinker, let's say, uh, besides the waste factor, now you can actually hopefully enjoy a nice porcelain mug uh, instead of adding those kind of paper plastic hybrid um, things that don't really taste that good to drink out of, uh, as well accessories like straws, utensils, stir sticks are only going to be by request. So you can still get them, but you have to ask for them. 
So it's no longer going to be the, the automatic that they're just throwing in with every meal. So that's where we got to. So now I'm going to take you through how we started and how we got there. So first, we recognized that there was a plastic and waste problem. Uh, this was the organization was started by three of us that all really hated what we were seeing. And we started doing a little bit of research and we realized just how big the problem is. Uh, now, waste in general, for example, if you talk about plastic that's in the ocean, uh, a huge amount of it is related to fishing, uh, the fishing industry. That's not something that we in Edmonton could really do a lot uh, tackling at a municipal level. There's a lot of other issues as well, but what could we deal with uh, just from a, an, an Edmonton and area basis. So we started looking into single use items, the things that we, we generally see here getting thrown out a lot uh, after very little use. Uh, so they have very little utility, you barely use them, and then they, they stick around in their environment forever. So why were we looking at these items? Uh, first off, anything that we make, there's environmental impact throughout the, the process uh, from extraction um, creation of the, the plastic, in this case, if we're talking about a plastic bag or straw, uh, then it becomes waste. You use it and then we get rid of it. Uh, maybe it gets incinerated in some countries, maybe it gets to landfill, uh, or maybe it's just littered. Uh, so each of those steps, there's a lot of environmental impact. Uh, we've seen the, the, the photos, we've seen it our, ourselves, uh, just walking through the river valley, uh, the, the straw in the turtle's nose, the, the birds eating plastic that they think is food. Uh, a lot of environmental impacts associated with, with these items. And when you do cleanups on beaches and rivers and, and river valleys, uh, these single use items are some of the most commonly littered items. There's a climate connection. I mean, obviously uh, if things are made of plastic, uh, it, it takes fossil fuels to make those. Uh, but even things that aren't made of plastic, there's still a, a climate impact associated with them. and uh, for example, with a water bottle, uh, it, it takes a quarter of a liter of oil to make one bottle, and then it takes three times the amount of water that actually goes in the bottle to make the bottle. So, I mean, there's, there's environmental impacts throughout. There are also health impacts. Uh, with plastic, it, it doesn't biodegrade. It doesn't turn to soil. Uh, it just gets smaller and smaller. It's eroded down, uh, and it degrades into microplastics which uh, studies are have shown that these are in our water uh, in our food in our beer uh, passing the lining into our brain in in breast milk uh, so i mean these, these are everywhere and they're getting into our bodies and the fact is we don't really know the full extent of, of how bad they are for us um, but i would assume that it's not good and i think that as research continues we're going to find just how how many problems these are causing um, I hear, hear, just saw something today on Twitter, someone say that microplastics are the new lead, it's our generation's lead, right? Something that, that's everywhere that we don't know yet the exact, um, just how bad they are for us, but we know that they're in us. There's also a lot of economic impacts associated with, uh, with single use plastics and, and waste. Um, the fact is that any of these things, whether it's sent to recycling or compost or, um, or the landfill, or if it's just littered, uh, the city has to deal with these. And that ends up costing us all more money through, through taxes, of course. Uh, then there's, of course, people who say, well, like, these can be recycled, but they can't. Um, the fact is that with plastic, generally only 9% uh, of plastics are recycled in Canada. And in Edmonton, if you put a, uh, the, a straw, let's say, or a, uh, a disposable uh, container from a takeout container or a cup, uh, into your recycling, they're not going to get recycled. Uh, none of those things are recyclable in, in Edmonton. They're, they end up being filtered out of the system. As well, there's the idea of the, the green substitutes for plastic, so things that are biodegradable or compostable or plant-based. And although there's many different iterations of these types of, of materials, uh, for the most part, uh, especially if we look at Edmonton, these are not actually going to degrade. Uh, many things that are labeled as compostable are only compostable under certain heat and, uh, and time conditions, which aren't found in the Edmonton system. So if you put in Edmonton a compostable container into your green bin, uh, that's actually just contaminating it and it'll have to be filtered out later, again, at a cost to Edmontonians. 
Uh, so these, are, for many reasons, aren't really great substitutes for single-use items. So knowing all of this, we decided to take action. Uh, but what did we want? How were we actually going to, to cause change? So we engaged in strategic planning. Now, strategic planning can be a, a very lengthy process. Uh, businesses and organizations do this routinely. Um, other not-for-profits I've been involved with, uh, you hire someone to help you and you go through an entire day or weekend of identifying what your vision is and, and how you're going to get there. But this organization started out with three of us around a table and we didn't have the resources to do that. So we sat around and we brainstormed and we talked about what did we want to, to do? What did we want to see? And how were we gonna get there? So our vision was to have Edmonton as a global leader in waste reduction that focused its efforts on stopping waste at its source. So not just being really good at recycling or composting, or, but actually not even creating the waste in the first place. And that was really our, our, our vision and still is. Uh, but then how are we going to achieve that? And so some organizations uh, target individuals like the general public, uh, some will deal more with businesses and some will go straight to government. And we really saw, even though we were very small at that time, uh, we saw this as really needing to involve all three, that we needed to, to deal with, with individuals, government and businesses, and each of them in their own way. Now we had barriers. Um, this here on the spreadsheet or on the presentation isn't a, a SWOT analysis with strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, uh, but it's, it's just some of the very general issues that we had. Um, lack of people, again, there was three of us. Lack of a network. Uh, I, by trade, am a lawyer. I'm an insurance defense lawyer. I don't have uh, a network of people that are into environmental causes or people that could help us with, um, with this uh, initiative. Uh, we had no social media presence because uh, we were brand new and no training either. I, I didn't have a Twitter account. Uh, I'd never used an Instagram account. I'd never been on either of those, uh, only Facebook. Uh, we had no website and we had really because of the lack of all of those things we had no legitimacy um why would people listen to us right? what what did we have to really offer but we did have strengths uh, we had passion and, and that's a really big one obviously when you're you're trying to start an organization uh, or an initiative uh, we also had a knowledge of public policy and law so myself and one of the other co-founders were both lawyers uh we were both uh, able to, to understand and re research laws throughout various jurisdictions in the world um, and understand how uh, public policy worked and getting laws into effect at a municipal level. We're also very organized and, uh, and nerdy about planning. So we knew that these were things that we were good at, uh, but how did we overcome the barriers? We'll get to that in a second. So this is how we started. Um, that's just myself, Melissa, and Michael. Uh, Michael's the one in the bag monster costume. And that's my son um, wearing a mini bag monster costume. It just says, please don't let my generation drown in plastic. That was the first, one of the first things that we did was go to the Strathcona uh, Farmer's Market and get uh, petition signatures. Um, so that was one of our earliest photos of the organization in, in 2018. So what did we do on those first, first days? Well, first we started with research. Uh, to get legitimacy, to be able to do what we needed to do, we needed to know what we were talking about. So our first step was to do a jur jurisdictional scan. So look what other uh, cities, provinces, states, countries were doing on the issue of single-use plastics and, and other single-use items. Uh, and then start essentially door knocking, reaching out for support, uh, getting in touch with any contacts we had or just kind of cold calling people and organizations to try to get the assistance we needed. So post-secondary education is a great source of knowledge, a great uh, source of uh, recruitment. Um, student groups, we've had many student groups do uh, projects for us. Uh, and again, something that uh, very little work on our behalf with three people starting out, uh, but a lot of, of gain at no cost. Uh, we reached out to marketing agencies to see if anyone would take us on pro bono to make a website, uh, to do other things. And then we started networking with other not-for-profits so that we could, could kind of get into the same circles as, as they were in. So doing these steps, we removed a lot of our initial barriers. So lack of people, um, through reaching out to universities, uh, to U of A and, and McEwen in particular, we had two really solid volunteers right away. 
one who had experience in communications and who uh, could do our social media. And then one uh, who was interested in events and outreach, who could plan things for us, who could get us into farmers markets, that sort of thing. Uh, the lack of network. So we reached out to Edmonton River Valley Conservation Coalition, universities, uh, a lot of other groups, and they started sharing about us. Uh, social media, well, it's relatively easy to start. Um, at first, it was just me not knowing what I was doing. And then after we got someone who, who was trained in the area, that really took off. Uh, one of the marketing agencies we reached out to, FKA, they took us on pro bono. They created the website. They created our branding, our logo. Um, so that is a huge step towards legitimacy. And so the research and all of these steps, all of a sudden, even though we were small, we were a real organization that people were going to listen to. So back to this, and I'll be showing this uh, a few times throughout, how to reach the government. So this was our, our first step is, is government. And the thing is the individual business and government, it's all interconnected, but uh, one of our biggest goals involved the government. So that's where I'm gonna start. So for how to reach the government, I would say the important thing is to have a specific ask. Don't just say to, in this case, the city council, hey, you need to do something about the single use problem. Uh, Rather, it's you need to do something about the single use problem. This is what you should do and why. So our specific ask, we developed a framework, uh, a single use framework that uh, had what, based upon our research, we thought uh, each of these items should be addressed. Um, how utensils, how straws should be addressed, how cups, bags. Um, and we, we had that on our website. We had that sent to all the counselors. And that was the basis for, for what we were asking for the next several years. Uh, now, related to that in how you reach government is you have to know your stuff. So th there, I'm not a city councilor. I've never been one. I've never been elected representative. I know they want to hear from all their constituents. But there's a difference between a constituent who's just getting angry about things uh, or even one who's specifically asking for something versus the ones who are asking for something and explaining why and explaining how they got that information and why they came to that, uh, that reasoning. And so you have to do your research, whatever it is that you're trying to, to move forward. Because otherwise, while they, they might listen to you, they're not going to really hear you. So we did our research, we compiled reports from other, other governments, academic articles, developed our framework we had it all on our website we had it all available for for city administration and city council that included things and, and these maps are a bit dated but showing where this was done in other uh, other countries uh, throughout the world uh where it had been done other places in canada uh to a certain extent and most of these just had to do with, with bags at, at that time in canada um dealing with things other than plastic bags is more more recent relatively and showing when we say so that we know our stuff, not just saying that do this thing, uh, but saying do this thing and it will work because it has worked elsewhere. Now, we had the advantage of being able to get that in our research that some countries had already taken some steps towards single use items. And then they had seen what the impact was. So, for example, in England, a 5p charge, so 5 pence charge for plastic bags. Uh, resulted in 85% reduction. So that's just a small charge and it was a huge reduction. Uh, so we were able to point to how these things had been effective elsewhere. And there was no reason to think they wouldn't be here in Edmonton. So that's knowing our stuff and knowing what we're asking for. But even if you're a powerful organization, uh, which at that time we were still pretty small and relatively speaking, we still are, you still need to show public support. Uh, the general public being behind what you're asking for makes a huge difference. One way to, to show that is by doing a petition. So we had a paper and an online petition that was a real focus uh, in our first couple of years where we were at events, we were posting all the time online, trying to show that people wanted this and they supported what we were asking for. And that was good, uh, although a lot of work for, um, it takes a lot to get people, a, a large number of people to sign a petition. 
And so whether you get 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000 people, uh, it, it's good, but it, and it'll show some support, but um, I think even more important is to get people to take part in, in government research. So uh, the city at multiple times throughout this process did sought public feedback and they did this through a uh, future of waste surveys where they ask questions about, uh, about waste generally in Edmonton, uh, single use items. And we really tried hard to get as many people as possible to uh, either go to these in-person sessions or to do the online uh, forms and, and fill out them out. They were short. And I think that this was really big for us because if you have uh, a thousand people uh, that you get extra to, that otherwise wouldn't have known about the survey, that now fill it out and show support for something, that could be a huge percentage of the total num number of people that are actually uh, filling out the, the survey. So getting people to show support in that way or emailing their counselors, uh, I think was really, really big for us. Now I'll talk later about our school program, but this, uh, this is, we had a kind of a postcard campaign from, from elementary students. And I think this might've been great for a student and we had permission to, to share this and we did, right? Stood up in city council chambers and, and read this and had it on the screen. Um, so I want you to act on single use plastics because most people don't care about a problem if it doesn't affect them. In case you haven't realized, humans are extremely selfish. But if you're not doing something about it because it doesn't affect you, you're wrong. Humans are ingesting microplastics in food and plastic water bottles. Uh, these chemicals in the plastic can cause cancer and other problems, um, including hormone mischarges. I'm not sure what they were going for there. This is our future and we want to change it. Uh, so showing student support, I, I think, has a real visceral reaction uh, by, by people and, and council members. Um, and there were a lot of other postcards that we had uh, that, that said a lot of very, uh, very profound things from very young members of our society that these, are gonna, that these issues are going to affect the most. Then the next step of reaching government or the next part of it uh, is just to get them your message, get them it however you can. We set up meetings, we reached out to all city councillors. Uh, a lot of them were willing to talk with us, uh, some weren't. Uh, when our most recent election occurred, we met with all, where we reached out to all of the new councillors to see who would talk to us. Uh, Any time that this topic came up before the utility committee, uh, we were there speaking. Uh, and, and really, it was getting, getting them the information they needed uh, to make the decisions that we wanted them to make. So getting them what we were asking for, why, and showing them the kind of support that we had from public. Now, we also dealt, uh, when I say impact elections, what we did is, because this was an important issue to us, is we contacted every single, uh, every single person who was seeking a seat on council in the latest election for Edmonton. And we had a list of three questions. And one of them was, do you support uh, restrictions on single use items as proposed by Waste Free Edmonton? And we were able to get answers from, from many and then uh, put those out uh, and let people know so that uh, they knew whether or not one councillor uh, or one person who was seeking to become a councillor or mayor versus another, how they felt on this topic. Uh, so that was a way of, of of, of making this an issue in the election somewhat. Um, and, and then once we had answers from certain people that ended up becoming elected, now they were somewhat beholden to it. If they said that they were gonna support it, uh, it makes it a lot uh, easier to then say, well, remember when you said you were gonna support this? Now it's time to vote, support it. So that's kind of how we dealt with, with uh, government, uh, broadly speaking. Now. In order to get that public support that we were talking about, you need to reach out to individuals. And as well, there was no guarantee that this bylaw was going to work. And there's a lot of areas of waste that, that weren't going to be included in it. So we wanted to educate the public. Now, one of the big ways of doing this, of course, is social media. Um, we've posted lots on social media um, about all manners of topics. 
and and a lot of it had to do with educating people on single use uh, plastic and single use items. Really, it's about getting your message out however you can. So uh, not everyone's on social media, uh, and even if they are, it doesn't mean that they they know about you and follow you. Follow you. So we make presentations. Uh, unless there's a really valid reason not to, we don't turn down uh, speaking uh, requests. So this here, what I'm doing right now, uh, not sure who, who's going to see this might want to volunteer with Waste Freedom. Who's seeing this might own a business that they end up making a change. Uh, who's seeing this would maybe, have, if this was before the city council uh, hearing, would maybe write into their counselor. So this is one way of getting out there and, and really letting it be known uh, some of the reasons for what we're doing and, and to a certain extent what they can do. We hosted as many events as possible, uh, sometimes in conjunction with uh, like U of A or McEwen or other groups. Uh, so documentary screenings. Uh, and again, early in the process at each one of these, we would have our petition at the ready. Uh, host cleanups, something to get people out uh, seeing, doing good, clearing these things out of the river valley, but also seeing firsthand just how much is out there and that uh, how much of the garbage that they see out in the river valley uh, is from these single use items. And then what we did with the cleanups is we would do an audit at the end so that we could say, okay, we had X number of bags of, of garbage and we looked through five of them. And in those five, there were 30 uh, disposable coffee cups or what have you. And then again, make that known to city council, make that known to individuals through social media. Uh, we also tried to build a community. So we would host meetups where people would uh, be able to get together. There was no set agenda, no speaker. Uh, but just like-minded people getting together to talk about these things. You know, a little bit of an agenda, because again, we had our petition for a while there, but uh, mostly it was just about building community of like-minded individuals. So really it was about hosting as many events as possible. And we, by, by this time, had a, a large team. And if people had an idea of maybe reaching people in the spin community, okay, let's do a, a spin class, a waste-free spin class and uh or whatever ideas people had it's really about just getting out there uh getting your name known and getting your your message uh, across and so we we hosted as many events as we could uh, and we also attended other people's events so like veg fest farmers markets uh, other people's cleanups and we were there with a table um attending these things now i, I mentioned about our, our school program so our, we developed a, a Waste Free 101 school program where we would give presentations to, uh, I believe, grades four through nine um, about these issues. It was a fabulous program. Uh, we trained, uh, we had training for a, a large number of volunteers, and uh, we were getting to, out into uh, a lot of schools. And you'll notice I'm using the past tense there, and uh, I'll explain why in a, in a minute. Uh, so that's where these, these postcards came from. And it's, it's really something else when you're with, uh, with students and just how much they get it. Like they, they, they understand it better and, uh, and quicker than, uh, than many, many adults. Uh, we also had resources on our website, um, tips, tricks uh, of cutting it back on waste, uh, how, uh, where they could go to shop to buy things, let's say that are unpackaged or secondhand. Uh, so we had a lot of resources that way. And media. Uh, media is a fantastic way to reach individuals. Now, there's a problem in that you don't control the message exactly. Um, but on the other hand, uh, like, for example, this a war on plastic. At no point have we said we're in a war on plastic. Plastic is OK. Plastic is necessary in our society. Plastic saved millions of lives in the medical setting. Uh, but to a certain extent, we're in a war on unnecessary plastic, but that's too wordy to put on a on a front page of a newspaper. Uh, if you're starting your own initiative to try to get uh, to try to get change at a municipal or any other level, media is a fantastic resource because it is so wide reaching, and it's free. Uh, we a lot of times would send out. Uh, media releases. We would, we would craft really good media releases. We'd send it out. And the fact is, media people in the media industry are very uh, busy 
and they're always looking for new stories. So if you can give them a story, uh, give them something, uh, an angle, something to, to, to write on, uh, there's a good chance that they'll do it. So uh, I really recommend using that as, as a resource if you, if you can. Now, we also had a lot of focus campaigns, uh, which are a great way of, of reaching individuals. Now, we're, we might all means aren't marketing experts, um, but some of the things we've done have been really great, like our Textile Tuesdays, which is all about textile waste, business spotlights on businesses that are doing a good job in the waste area. Uh, and we did have some campaigns that were provided pro bono by uh, FKA Marketing. Um, and if you look at the uh, these two photos, so we had a whole campaign where it was kind of subverting the kind of classic holiday Christmas uh, photos, but showing what's kind of really happening behind the scenes. So you have all the, the boxes being piled up, uh, the Amazon boxes outside the, the house before Christmas and all the waste afterwards. And so we had a series of these things that we built a campaign around, uh, which really resonated with, with people and with, uh, with media as well. So that brings us to businesses. So how did we reach out to businesses? Now, as with any organization, we had uh, setbacks. Uh, I think three different times we brought people on to be uh, a manager of our business relations team. And for various reasons, uh, it never ended up working out. They ended up not doing the work and, and leaving either because they found a job in another city or they, they got ill or whatever the case may be. Uh, so we didn't do as much with businesses as we would have liked, uh, but we did provide, we created and provided resources, uh, pamphlets for best practices, uh, and it, it's pretty difficult to reach out to every business, even if you just have a certain subset of businesses, like every grocery store, every restaurant, there, there's thousands of them in Edmonton. So we tried to use uh, others networks to distribute these things. So uh, contacting Chamber of Commerce, Downtown Business Association, under 24th Avenue Business Association, all of these sort of groups to, to get it out to with as minimal work for us because we are, are limited in resources, um, but with as much of a, a bright, a wide uh, impact or wide uh, distribution as possible. Uh, and there's a number of things that we, uh, we recommended, um, for example, coffee shops, even if there's no bylaw, you can, you can charge for a cup. Uh, you can give reward points for a cup, uh, leave a bag, take a bag, uh, places like bulk barn, uh, would provide a discount if you bring in your own container. Uh, so there's a lot of things that, that businesses could do. Now we had targeted campaigns with businesses as well. Uh, one of our biggest ones that we started early when it was just the three of us was the last straw campaign, which was to try to get businesses to voluntarily go uh, straw free or only provide straws upon request. Uh, you know, straws might seem like the, the smallest thing, I mean, literally they're small, they're not recyclable. Uh, they end up in litter quite often. You only use them for a few minutes and they're not really even necessary by most people. Some people do need them if, if with certain disabilities, um, but most people don't need them or don't even want them or wouldn't even notice if they're in the drink or not. Uh, so we went through this campaign and uh, a lot of businesses joined and something like this is great because the feedback we got, like for example, from one bar on, on White Avenue, they said that they were estimating just by not automatically putting straws in things like highballs, that they were gonna save $1,800 a year on straws. That's eight, like almost $2,000 just on something that literally is just being thrown out and most people don't care about. Uh, so, uh, and they could still ask for it if they wanted. So uh, that worked really well and provided us also with kind of feedback that we could then use to go to city council uh, when we say, well, this is something that the companies that have done this have really found it to be, be quite successful. But, uh, that brings us to something that of course happened um, that caused some issues with our organization uh, as it did most organizations and that's COVID. So if we go back to late 2019, at that point we had grown from a, a team of three of us uh, to we had probably about a team of 30. Uh, so that's uh, people that were just doing the, the uh, education component to, to schools, 
Uh, we had a street team that we had just created that was going to go out to all of the festivals and events in the city uh, throughout the summer in 2020. Uh, we had um, a business team that had just got built up that was going to do a bring your own container campaign where it was having restaurants uh, encourage people to bring their own container for takeout or leftovers. We had a lot of events planned. Uh, we had a, a large social media and communications team. Uh, it, we, things were really rolling, but COVID. So if you look at these things, you, uh, street team, well, now there's no events to go to. So all these people that had been uh, joined and trained, uh, there was nowhere, not, nothing for them to do. Uh, our Waste Free 101, well, there was no school anymore. Uh, and certainly they weren't inviting people in when there were classes that were uh, in person. So now that went by the wayside. Uh, bring your own uh, container campaign. Well, that was supposed to launch March of 2020. And uh, all of a sudden that became like the worst timing to try to convince people that because even though now we know there's really no concern with uh, reusable containers, it's not a, a COVID risk. Uh, in those first few months, especially, uh, there was a lot of fear uh, because people didn't know how it was transmitted and uh, no one was going to be taking part in, in that. Uh, and hosting events, well, now, again, no events were going, uh, were going on. So, and unfortunately, it wasn't the case of you just pause, wait two years, and then start these things up. Because now the street team or the school team uh, is two years later, and they've moved on to doing other things or had other changes in their life. The business relations team, same thing. Uh, so it, it was a huge setback to us as an organization. Uh, because none of these things could could uh, go ahead. So what do we do? Uh, we kept going. We scaled back uh, somewhat out of necessity and and volunteers just not being able to 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 do these things anymore either because they couldn't be done or because they had their own changes in in their own life and their own struggles. Uh, we switched to virtual events, documentary screening, Zoom meetups, and we really kept the focus on getting vocal support for a single use bylaw and convincing councils and working with administration to try to have the most robust uh, and efficient and effective uh, potential bylaws possible. And now we kept through that. And as of a couple of weeks ago, we have a, a leading single use bylaw. And I say leading because even though plastic bags have been banned many places, let's say, uh, but when restaurants and coffee shops now will have to provide reusable option for drinking. That's something that's not widespread. That's something where Edmonton is really taking a lead on it. And, uh, and with all of these things in terms of Alberta, um, there's, there's now a lot of other municipalities in Alberta and elsewhere can point to Edmonton and say, well, if they can do it, we can do it. Uh, Victoria is looking at now copying some of what Edmonton has done with the uh, requiring the uh, reusable cups in restaurants and coffee shops. And so I'm, I'm to the extent that we were involved with that, I'm, I'm very happy and I'm very proud that a place like Victoria, that's normally much more, uh, uh, you think of them as being ahead on environmental, um, environmental issues and such, that now they're looking to Edmonton for, for their lead. And uh, so I'm very happy with where we're at and it's, it's been a long road to get here and there's a lot more to do, but um, it, it, the steps that we've taken, would we do it different? Probably, but uh, it's, it's helped lead us to where we are now. So thank you very much for listening. Um, here's just some of the information about Waste Free Edmonton, how you can follow us or, or contact us. And uh, I'm really interested in, in hearing any questions that you may have. Hey, thank you so much, Sean, for that very interesting talk. Loved hearing about the progression of Waste for Edmonton from its early days, even through COVID, because that's yeah, very true. There have been so many changes. Um, so we, uh, you might have seen that there is a uh, link to a Google form in the chat. So we'll be taking questions via the form, and then we'll be posing them to you just verbally here, Sean. Um, and I think I'll, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Akanksha, who will be taking the questions from the form and kind of moderating. And I'll jump in here and there if needed. So yeah, Kamsha, go ahead. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. It was really, really amazing to listen to everything Waste Free Edmonton has been doing. So the first question we have here, here is, 
are the cloth bags really more sustainable than the single use bags? Uh, great question. Uh, that's a, a yes and no. Um, they are if used properly. Uh, I like to, to use the example of, well, first, it, it depends on how much you reuse them. If every time you went to the grocery store, you had a new cloth bag and then you threw it out, then the single use thin plastic is, is much better. Uh, the bag, there's, I mean, a lot of impacts with, with uh, cotton or whatever it's made out of. And uh, so that would be much, much worse to do that. Uh, if you just use it three times, it's much worse. You, reusable thing has to actually be reused. Uh, and, but the thing is, when, when people think about some of these things, is like, well, now I'm going to have to buy it. Now I'm going to have to get a new bag. And, uh, but, but we all have bags. Um, I don't know a single person that doesn't own a backpack or a bag. Uh, and it doesn't need to be a ready-made, purpose-built grocery bag. Uh, my wife, when when she was uh, getting married to me before then, uh, at her stag at, they gave her some sort of, it was like a rhinestone-encrusted, uh, like, bride-to-be bag that she carried around with her that evening, that a lot of people would just take that and put it in the memory drawer or bottom of the closet, and then they would find it years later. And then that's wasteful. Like, because that bag, it took a lot to make that bag. Well, you know, I use that bag. I've been using that bag for, well, over a decade now uh, to the grocery store. So now that bag that otherwise would have no use has been used many times and has saved a lot of plastic. So it's, it's much, much more sustainable. So really the quick answer is just, it's better if it's actually reused. Uh, and depending on the material is how many times it has to be reused, but, uh, as long as you actually reuse it, then it, it's a much better option. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I feel um, a lot of us resonate with that when we do go out and get those reusable bags. Um, it also comes down to how much we're using it again. So thank you so much for that. I'll, I'll just, uh, just anecdotally. So uh, there was a person that told us that they were in line at a, at a Walmart. And this was up uh, during the boom in Fort McMurray. And a person was buying a couple of, of uh, a few cat, uh, like little bins uh, for cat litter. And uh, they were buying like five of them. And the person at the till said, oh, you have some new cats? And he said, no, no, I just don't like cleaning them out. So I just throw it out every time. And it's cheaper and easier just because they're like two, $2 each or whatever. So it was quicker and easier to just throw out and get new plastic. So obviously that is, is if, if the thing that is meant to be reused is not actually reused, it's, it's, it's much worse, so. Wow, that's very true. Thank you so much for sharing that. So uh, our next question here is by Cheryl. Uh, they are asking, now that the goal of tackling single-use plastics has been achieved, what is next? Well, when we started as an organization, uh, three of us sitting around the table, we were thinking about our name and our vision. And at that point, our main concern was single-use plastics. That's what we wanted to deal with. But we said, well, what if we want to do more? What if we want this to be bigger? Uh, because there's a lot of areas of waste. And so, for example, uh, in Calgary, there's an organization called Plastic Free YYC. And they had started up shortly before us. And we said, we don't want to be Plastic Free uh, YEG. Or we, we want to deal with waste. And so... And, and they, they do as well, but in, just in our name, we thought, even though we're focusing on plastics, let's look bigger. And so as we've been going, um, we've taken on textile waste, for example, which is something that is a huge problem. And we're not advocating for anything with the city right now, but we're educating uh, with posts about textiles every Tuesday. Uh, we've uh, taken on yard and lawn waste, for example, the, the awful practice of uh, raking up leaves, putting them in a plastic bag uh, for the city to take away and, and throw out. Uh, whereas those leaves are just nitrogen and you could just mulch them and leave them as free fertilizer on your lawn. That's also good for, for biodiversity and microorganisms. So that's something that we've dealt with and we want to deal with more. Uh, and the fact is plastics are still a problem. Um, and uh, this bylaw doesn't cover everything. For example, the, the takeout containers. 
Um, and there's no fee on takeout cups. So even though if you are going to dine in at a restaurant or fast food, they're going to have to give you a, a reusable cup. If you do drive through or takeout, they won't. Um, and there's no fee, no, in, no incentivization for people to bring their own a cup through drive through. So there's still issues that even next time the city looks at this, that we would hope that they'll, they'll add to it. Um, and, and other areas of plastic waste, like packaging in, in grocery stores and things like that, that, uh, that we're still tackling. So there, there's, there's never a shortage of things to, to deal with, but, uh, but we're very happy with this kind of milestone right now. Uh, and we're, we're also, even though this is the city of Edmonton, um, we've consulted with and presented to a lot of other municipalities. And I'm, I'm hoping that there's going to be phone calls from, uh, from all around Alberta uh, asking us to, to talk about these and so that they, other municipalities can look at their own uh, single use uh, bylaw options. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your next steps there. So something definitely to uh, look forward to. Um, our next question is sort of an anecdote. I noticed the other day that the neighborhood Starbucks is already offering ceramic to stay cups ahead of the ban. But what about the fast Starbucks and Ceases or McDonald's? I remember Tim Hortons had ceramic cup, ceramic mugs, but what will other fast chains do, fast food chains do? Well, I mean, they have to change. They'll have to provide something. Uh, like I said, there's not many places that have required this. One example is in Berkeley, California, where uh, if you go to a McDonald's in Berkeley, California, uh, you will get a reusable cup, reusable plate, reusable utensils. I mean, this is something that McDonald's has had to do elsewhere. And I don't know if they'll just take what they did elsewhere and, and import it here, or if they'll think of some, something different. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's going to be nice to, to see. Um, I, I don't know, if, is a &W, for example, going to provide their, their big glass mugs like they used to? That, uh, as a kid, I love drinking out of the big glass root beer mugs. Uh, or are they going to have something different? Um, don't know. Uh, each place will have to decide what they want to do. My hope uh, as a consumer is that uh, particularly coffee places, they're going to give us something that's nice to drink out of. I, I, I want to drink out of a nice mug. That's the part of the experience. Um, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how the different uh, organizations, both big and, and small local ones, how they uh, adjust to this. Thank you. Um, our next question is very similar. So I'm just going to jump to the one after. Um, what are the logistics of implementing a city ban on international companies? Uh, sorry, a city, a, a ban on international companies? Yeah. Uh, I don't even know if they can do that. Um, but really, this isn't an, an issue of just international, uh, it, it, like relating to this bylaw, it's not just an issue of uh, international companies. This isn't just McDonald's. Um, this isn't just Starbucks. Uh, for example, one of the things in the ban that, in the bylaw uh, is styrofoam takeout containers and, and drink containers will be banned. Uh, for the most part, in my experience, the places that are still giving food and styrofoam are, 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 are local. Those are local organizations, local businesses. Um, and I, I have a, a five-year-old child at home and he, uh, I was reading to him books from when I was a kid. Uh, and these are books from the 80s where they're talking about how bad styrofoam was. So this is, that's not a new thing. I mean, that, this is something that should have been phased out long ago. Um, so then they'll have to. So, but getting back to the question, it's not just a multinational company versus local. I mean, all, all companies have to make changes. And yes, some local small companies have made uh, changes quicker, but there's also some really good examples of, of larger ones. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think this question is about workshops. Um, they're asking, would you be interested in working with other parts of the university directly outside of doing workshops? So other than workshops. Yeah, well, we, uh, I mean, we have worked uh, with the university, uh, different groups with, with uh, uh, Sustain SU. We've worked, right, right now we have with the 
uh, Faculty of Business uh, MBA program. They have a net impact net impact program where MBA students uh, do research uh, and and do various projects. Uh, and this year, I, I believe it's mostly for not for profits. And right now, uh, we're working with with them to to do a, a project actually related to the yard waste that I, that I spoke uh, about earlier. Um, so yeah, I mean we we as an organization are open to pretty much anything it just depends on on resourcing uh and and that's one of the things that you have to remember with if whether if you're starting your own organization uh, or if you're dealing with uh with another organization is that resources are limited um i would love to go personally speak to uh any business that asked me to come and, and do so but uh, and we try to say yes as much as possible but the fact is we all everyone who's on our board, for example, has day jobs. Um, so it does make it difficult to a certain extent to, to be able to do that. Uh, but yes, of course, we're, we try to work with universities a lot. Great. Um, our next question is asking for your comments on the green bin program that Edmonton is doing. Do you think it is going well and is doing what it is supposed to be doing? I can't speak to it from the back end perspective in terms of um, how how good people are doing it actually like putting the right thing in the right bin and all of that um, because I'm not with the city I'm not I'm not sure but I know even anecdotally there were the, the main concern that we heard when that was coming in is uh, I have a family of four how am I possibly going to fit all my garbage in a that size bin uh, to be taken away once every two weeks. That's impossible. I'm going to have to go throw it in the park or something. And that was a lot of people were concerned about that. And fair enough. What we always said is that we'll now take this as an opportunity to consider what it is you're throwing out. Is the thing you're throwing out something that you needed to get? Is you could have you avoided it somehow? Is your garbage filled with a bunch of uh because you took a, a takeout coffee container a coffee cup every day on your way home from work and then you have to throw it out uh and in which case take it reusable and now you don't have that garbage uh are there things in there that you could have composted are there things in there that are just unnecessary packaging that you could have reused like i don't know bags that some berries came in that you can use for putting your cat litter into I mean, there's there's lots of ways to reduce your waste, and it, it we really try to treat this as a positive thing where people can you can make these changes, and this is forcing you to do so. So from that respect, I think it has been really positive. Um, and I know a lot of people that they're they pick the smaller one where it's cheaper, and so they're like, yeah, you know, what? I can fit my garbage in there. Like we'll do this to save that extra, however much it is a month to get the smaller one. We'll will uh, will do that and they are and so it's really reducing waste in that respect uh, at least anecdotally yeah thank you so much i think this will be our last question now before we wrap up with a couple volunteer opportunities and what can be done next so based on your experiences have you seen changes maybe influenced by actions like those waste free edmonton has taken in the way that local governments try and engage with communities and encourage more participation in those processes. Uh, yeah, well, Edmonton, I can tell you throughout this process from 2018 to today, uh, there were probably, oh, I don't know, six different rounds of public consultation about waste. And now Edmonton, fair enough, they were undergoing a, it wasn't not just with respect to single use by law but large a lot of waste uh related uh waste related uh uh changes like the bin system that was asked about uh and a lot of other things too and they were really seeking a lot of public feedback and like i said i think that is one of the really big things that we were able to do uh is to get people out filling out those surveys um getting their voices heard and I mean, of course, from our standpoint, if we're putting it on our social media to people, most people that are following us probably feel somewhat similar to how we feel. So these are now the people that are getting their voices heard. Uh, so I, I 
and and the the answers to those surveys and end up in reports that go to the, the various uh, council committees and city council. So I think that that is a huge area where everyone, if you're interested in a topic, whatever it might be, um, I know with the city of Edmonton, you can sign up and you you get sent all of these things, whether it's about waste or swimming pools or road construction and. And I really do encourage people to to fill those out. And uh, if you have a particular, if you're starting your own organization or you have your own initiative or thing that you're passionate about, share those things and get people to to complete them and have their voice heard because it, I think it does make a huge difference. Hey, wonderful. I guess I'll chime in now. Um, there were a couple of questions. I wasn't sure if it was directed to the Sustainability Council or Waste Free Edmonton about how to volunteer, how to get involved. Um, Sean, maybe do you want to speak to that on the Waste Free Edmonton sign side of things? Yeah, well, with uh, Waste Free Edmonton, uh, I mean, you have my email there. Uh, you can also email info at wastefree.ca uh, or contact us through uh, through one of the direct messaging on, on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, email is probably best, though. Uh, because we always have, even though we had to scale back a lot, uh, we're, we're starting to, I'll say, sustainably grow at this point. Uh, before it was fast and furious. Now it, it's, it's tough to a certain extent to, let's say, plan an event when you don't know uh, what the, the COVID numbers might be at the time. Or now things, at least from a uh, public health restriction standpoint, seem to be uh, at a... a fairly constant point, but that not to say that's not going to change. So, I mean, we don't want to invest a lot of resources and time into something that we're not going to be able to go ahead with, uh, but we have a lot still going on and, uh, and we're going to keep growing. And so, yeah, we definitely welcome uh, people contacting us to, uh, to potentially work with Waste Free Edmonton in, in an area that, that you're uh, interested in, um, whether that be communications or events or finances or fundraising. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much, Sean. And um, on our side too, I don't know if the question was directed for the Sustainability Council, but we also um, look for support for our various initiatives uh, and you can email us. Maybe someone can throw a, a general email in the chat and we can connect you up with those opportunities. Uh, so just to wrap up, I see we're just a little over time. Thank you, Sean, so much for taking the time to walk us through kind of the history of uh, Waste Street Edmonton, where where it's been where it's going and uh, really liked the, the q a period here um yeah the, the dialogue with uh, with those who are here today uh i'd also like to thank the staff from the sustainability council who supported the lecture today so hussein albert kabi who is in the back end working with tech and also a Yola, who uh, supported the q a uh thank you both for your support in today's lecture uh yeah and on behalf of the sustainability council generally um we appreciate all of your attendance today and hope that you learned a thing or two Feel free to tune in. Our next kind of partnered talk for the lecture series is an EPL at Edmonton Public Library talk with uh, Yale Britta researchers Deborah Davidson and Sri Mukherjee. And in case you're interested in that, um, I will just put the link to register in the chat. Okay, there it is. But I uh, uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, and again, the, the video will be posted in a couple of weeks on our YouTube channel. Take care, everyone.